So what I wanted to begin with is to go back and review where we are in the overall process of this whole uh, I knew you were do area. So we're beginning, we started, we looked at some of the history, we looked at uh, Shakyamuni Buddha and a few things about him and the basic principles that he was trying to express and how Buddhism developed a little bit in India. And we also then looked at the transmission of Buddhism from India into Tibet. And Padmasambhava being a key figure there, but there were previous kings who, through their raiding activities, had also encountered Buddhism in different places and had even married uh, Buddhist wives and so forth. So Buddhism was actually there before Padmasambhava. Uh, and in fact, uh, and they had invited other people to come uh, and build the monastery of Samye uh, prior to inviting Pabasabhava because it kept getting torn down at night when they were trying to construct it. So they invited other people and a number of key figures were there and a part of that early development. And that went on for a period of time before uh, Langdharma, one of the, the uh, Bon-oriented kings decided that we needed to do away with that and basically destroyed all the monasteries and, and told all of the monks and nuns that they either had to leave and go home or be killed. And so there was this period of destruction of things, but the practice kept on. Uh, people did it as householders for the most part. Uh, it was pretty much as taught by Pabba Subhava, a householder kind of a tradition anyway. But they did that and in addition to that, there were some areas that were outside of the control of the king that continued. There were some monastic institutions, the small ones, remote areas that also were able to continue as a part of that. Well, then around the year 1000, because that was around the year 800, basically, around the year 1000, we got a whole series of invasions into India of Muslims. And that put a lot of pressure on the Buddhist tradition. And we started to get people who were moving or migrating up into Tibet out of India. And with the destruction of Lalanda University, uh, that was kind of the final chapter of Buddhism as a really strong uh, uh, religious tradition in India. Not that it completely disappeared, but uh, the strength disappeared. And so we had the Muslim area, particularly in what is now Pakistan, and, and they had moved far beyond that as well, but kind of uh, restricted that. In fact, there were some areas, I remember when Pakistan was originally created, there were two parts of Pakistan, one on the east, one on the west, and both of them were predominantly Muslim. So it gives you an indication of how far that they went clear across India at that time. And so uh, that became, that all kind of went by the wayside. Uh, Hinduism grew and during that time gained in strength, even though it predates Buddhism a little bit. It's, it's a little hard to say exactly when Hinduism starts because it's based on the Vedas, which is a very, very ancient tradition. And yet the Vedas were not really what Hinduism is today. And so those come along, three of the four Vedas were uh, popular prior to the Buddha. There's one, the last of the four Vedas was actually written after the time of the Buddha. And then the Upanishads, there were some Upanishads, which are kind of commentaries on the Vedas basically. Uh, that were written prior to the Buddha, but more of them were written after the time of the Buddha. And then like the Bhagavad Gita was written after, well after the time of the Buddha and so forth as well. So the Hinduism itself uh, came a little bit later, but also kind of at the same time. It actually maybe you could say started a little bit before and really developed through that whole period and continued its development as Buddhism was actually declining, Hinduism was getting stronger. So there was this period of time, but as that migration up into Tibet happened, 
they have this resurgence of Buddhist practice in Tibet. And so we have the creation of the three other lineages, the, uh, the three main lineages of Buddhism that were a part of that. Uh, first we had the uh, Kadampa, which was created by Atisha, which later was taken over and you know, reinvigorated and became the Galukpas under Jaitsakamba. And so we had those. Uh, we had the um, uh, Kagyu order, uh, which was another one of the three, and then we had the Sakyas, which was the third. So those are called the new schools, the Sarma schools. And so between the time of Pamasabhava and the time of, say, Atisha, one of the early people going back in the second dissemination, things in India went through its own transmission or, or change over a period of about 200 years. And so by the time the new schools come in, the texts have been modified a little bit, things are a little different and so forth. And so we get some contention between the what became known as the Nyingma, the old school, the, the foundation that was established by Pabas Sabava, and the new schools coming in with had slightly different points of view, slightly different philosophies, slightly different texts, and so forth. Now the Nyingma had, as I mentioned, continued during that time, mostly as householders, but there were some monastic traditions. The Kagi order actually helped the Nyingma reestablish their monastic tradition at that time. So we see the Nyingma then going back into more or a stronger version of the monastic tradition. If you were going to just look at these four in general, you would say that the Nyingma is the most practice oriented of the four. The Kagyu is second in that order. Then the uh, uh, Galukpas would be at the other extreme, and the Sakyas are kind of like them in terms of a more monastic, scholastic kind of uh, tradition. But the Galukpas do do practice, of course, and the Nyingmas do do scholarship. So <laughs> it's a range, it's just a degree of difference between them. So those came up. So in terms of the actual practices then, uh, what we began looking at was the four paths. So the first path was the path of individual liberation. And so we looked at it in terms of the three trainings of ethics, meditation, and wisdom. And then we took on the path of altruism or the path of the bodhisattva. And under that one, uh, we also looked at the uh, ethics and the meditations and the wisdom aspects of those. And then we went on to the path of Tantra, which is part of where we are now. We looked then at the um, preliminary practices, the common nundro practices, the four thoughts that turn the mind, and then we also looked at the practices of the uncommon nundro, of the refuge in bodhicitta, and the offering mandala, and the, the guru yoga, and uh, they're skipping thing, well, oh, vajrasattva purification, I knew that I needed another finger in there somewhere, <laughs> and uh, so we looked at all of those, and then we looked at the generation stage, where you generate an image, a vision, of a particular deity and the palace in which they are uh, actually seated and, and creates their environment, if you will, and the other deities that are a part of that, and the protective circle around the whole thing, the whole universe is encapsulated in that, and so forth. So we generate this mandala with the deity in the center of that, we meditate on it. As we do these practices, we start with relatively simple, images of deities, usually without a complete mandala, and then we go to more complex ones. Then we go to highest yoga tantra, where you have male and female in union together, as well as wrathful forms of the deities to help us deal with the more obscure kinds of afflictive emotions and mental obscurations that we have, and so forth. And then we get to where we are now. And that is the completion stage practices. So in the generation stage, what we're doing is we're trying to develop 
a sense of pure view. If you recall, pure view has to do with seeing all sentient beings as Buddhas, all sounds as mantras, all uh, thoughts as the, the sound or wisdom of a Buddha, all other phenomena as being a perfect Buddha field. And so it's the mandala, the thing that we have been practicing on as a meditation, we begin to see in our world, okay? Becomes the mandala of the particular deity that we're doing our practice with. And so that idea of pure view is really critical. That's the ethical position, if you will, of the path of Tantra. And so as we go through these practices from the generation stage to completion stage, part of what we're doing is going from an impure illusory body to a pure illusory body. The basic difference, and there are some subtleties and differences between uh, various uh, traditions within the broader tradition, but the basic idea is that we visualize, we cognitively understand ourselves to be a Buddha, but we're not really a Buddha. So it's impure in that sense. As we begin doing the completion stage practices, we begin working with the channels, winds, and drops primarily inside of ourselves. And so that begins to transform the more subtle aspects of our being into a real Buddha. And so we're going from impure illusory body to pure illusory body. Still illusory, <laughs> but we understand that illusory nature as the real nature of a Buddha. And so we move, we make that transition, we begin to focus on the idea of bliss emptiness, which is the wisdom aspect of this tradition. So today, I'm going to go through and talk about some of the phases and a couple of the early practices in this tradition.